God's blessing on our time tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you in simple childlike faith for the promise that you've given to us that where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' holy name, he's promised to be there. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll bless us as we gather around your word, that you'll feed your people, that you'll feed your lambs by your word by your Holy Spirit, by his power, by his supernatural ability. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. We're going to begin by reading a few verses over in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 3, where Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We're going to stop reading right there. He goes on to give a few more of the blessings for those who suffer and who endure persecution for the right reasons. These verses that we just read really breathe, if you look at them, the type of individual that is blessed here, the poor in spirit, the ones that mourn, the meek, those who are hungry and thirsty, the merciful, the clean in heart, the peacemakers, it really breathes a spirit of gentleness and a Christ-likeness here. These are things that are to characterize those who follow Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you a message tonight um, that's entitled, Blessed Are the Teachable. That's almost how we could sum a lot of this up here. Blessed are those who remain in a certain state of purity and of innocency so that they can receive from God, and through receiving from God, they can grow to be more and more like God. I know blessed are the teachable is not in Matthew 5, But you see what I'm saying? It really does breathe the spirit of gentleness here. A teachable person is one who remains, well, all of these things. Starting with, first and not last and not least, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who remain in these states, remain in the state of being poor in spirit and of mourning over various things as we've studied before and the meek and so forth. Why, even look at verse 6, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So they're not in some passive state. They're actually longing for something. They're actually looking forward. There it says righteousness. Blessed are those who are hungering and thirsting for that. Well, I surely would think that would include blessed are those who are teachable and who remain teachable, who are teachable and who remain that way. It seems uh, that we've had a lot of studies in the past couple of weeks around here, some rather strong words along certain lines. And I just felt that tonight the Lord probably wanted to give us a message that would balance some of that, that would balance that. And that seems to be in the spirit of what's already been said and what's been going on here thus far tonight. So kind of think, keep that in the back of your mind as we do our study in the Word of God tonight that I believe that it's a necessary message to help bring balance to what we've been looking at in whether it's been theology or some other series over the last couple of weeks here. Because in the charismatic movement, my observation of it, and maybe even more narrowly among some of the overcomers groups, is that a lot of people have lost some of their, they've lost their um, innocency that they had at one time, probably, and and they've grown in contention, probably because there have been so many conflicting views and so many conflicting teachings and warnings and counter-warnings, and people in the charismatic movement in general just become gun-shy over all that. You know, eventually, whenever you first come into it, let me say that and start earlier, you're just open. You're open to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Maybe sometimes too open, but at least you're open. You're open to what the Holy Spirit has to do and what he has to speak and what he has to say. But eventually, if there are enough conflicting teachings that come forth, if you just stay around long enough and see that, uh, that there are problems, 
And that's no surprise in any true move of God. There are always going to be the devil's problems alongside that. But people begin to grow a little gun shy. They start retreating. They draw back into their shell. Sometimes people kind of, you know, become an authority themselves. Well, I, I'm not even going to get involved because I heard Reverend so-and-so gave a teaching and then Brother Reverend Dr. Mr. Priest so-and-so gave another one and that conflicted and I thought that we were all following God and following the Holy Spirit. And you, you get a little gun shy and uh, uh, maybe suspicious, maybe cynical is even a better word. Well, like, who has the truth, and how am I ever going to know it? How am I ever going to know that I know it? How am I ever going to be able to receive that? So people get a little complacent, or a little too settled, and a little too proud to change. They become hardened through their life, through the teachings they've heard, through the experiences they've gone through. Well, I trust you know what I'm talking about. There are a lot of people out there that are at that point right now. Some people just withdraw from Christian fellowship completely, which is never the answer. They just withdraw from the church. Too much going on. There's just too much confusion, and I can't get settled down, and it's giving me problems. And, well, you know, there's, there's a way to deal with all of this, and the way to deal with it is to stay, as Jesus said, poor in spirit and to remain teachable. God's still got a lot that he's got to do in the earth before he's through with everything. And he's still got a lot to do in the church before he's through with the church. If that were not true... Well, the end would be upon us. We would have already arrived. But that we haven't arrived indicates something as far as I'm concerned. That the end isn't here yet indicates something. That God still has a lot to do in the world. He still has a lot to do in the church. He still has a lot to do in us. Amen. He has a lot to do in us. And the key is to remain open to the Holy Spirit. And, and the key is to... Although on one hand or on one side you are aware of, because you have to be aware. I mean, the Bible itself tells us uh, not to be naive, but to discern and test and try the spirits. And maybe those were some things you didn't do back when you first got in the charismatic movement. You're blessed, but you didn't do that. Well, you've got to do that because that's in the Bible, but you can't do that in such a way that you end up becoming cynical over everything. Like, well, I'm expecting the worst. We as Christians, we as charismatics who have a positive word from God, we should be expecting the best all the time. Expecting the best. It will transform you and turn you into another person if you grow to be the type of individual who's always expecting the worst to come. It'll, that'll transform you into another individual. It doesn't happen overnight. It's gradual. And, and people have been a part of this because of the various things that have been going on in the charismatic movement at large suspicions and cynicism creeps into it. People are not teachable anymore. It's almost, um, well, it's certainly nothing in your favor to be teachable because you're always warned. Well, you may be open. You may be open to the wrong thing. You may be open to the wrong spirit. And praise God, there's the other side. The Bible does say that we should use discernment, that we should not believe every spirit, 1 John 4, 1, but try the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. But through it all, too many people have become hardened. And I think what the Lord wants to speak to us tonight is just a warning that through it all that we don't grow hardened to what it's all about, to the life and to the joy and to the enthusiasm, what it means to have the Holy Spirit, to the privilege of having the Word of God, the privilege of owning a book that we call the Bible, the Word of God, that we don't grow hardened toward that or cynical or just complacent toward that. There, there's more victory in the Christian walk than there is defeat. I mean, there's more joy than there is sorrow in the Christian walk, especially once you receive the Holy Spirit. This is a full life that God has intended for us to experience and to grow up in and to live in and to learn to love what God is doing in our midst. Amen. And I think that's what these Beatitudes are breathing forth to us, a spirit not of one who has become hardened to things, but of just the opposite, one who is innocent, one who is innocent, one who is gentle, one who is childlike. The poor in spirit, those that mourn, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, that breathes the spirit of gentleness and of Christ-likeness. That's what God wants us to keep. If we don't keep that... Uh, we're not going to be remaining in a teachable state. And if we don't remain there, then the Holy Spirit can't continue to speak to us or work in us. We might think that we are teachable and 
I, I trust that we are, that most of us are, that all of us are most of the way. But I know that it's not true of some people that you get so hard and callous and, quote, mature, unquote, in it that you just cease to be open to anything else the Holy Spirit's going to do. For some strange reason, people end up being open for other spirits to speak to them, but not to the Holy Spirit, though. They're not teachable to that anymore. We've just got to guard ourselves that we never grow to that state. I say grow, but people do through just their experiences. They grow up to that state of ceasing to be teachable. So let me mention a few stumbling blocks to uh, remaining teachable. Like uh, we can mention a lot of things, but like the intellect. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, some people think I, I'm too smart to have to study the Bible. I've been to school, you know, in the intellect, education. I've got education. You know, I'm smart. I, I'm this, I'm that. Uh, I don't have to remain teachable. The Bible, the Bible, I mean, of all books, who wants to be taught out of that? Some people actually say that. Some people don't say that. But, you know, there may be an aspect of that that's true. Or if it's not like that, it's, it's spiritual intellect. Well, I already know those things. I've already read the Bible. I've already studied that book. I've already gone through those passages. So our intellect, our study, our education becomes then a stumbling block to remaining open to what Jesus said was the Holy Spirit's ministry. He said, whenever I send the Spirit of truth, he'll guide you. He'll guide you into all truth. Whenever I send you the Spirit of truth, he'll guide you into all truth. Well, he's not, friends, if we don't stay open to that. The, the Holy Spirit is not uh, an, an elephant. He's a dove. He's gentle. He doesn't force us into things. He's not an eagle or a vulture. He's a dove. He descended in the bodily form of a dove. Not an eagle or a vulture, but a dove. He's gentle. He doesn't force himself. If we don't remain open and stay teachable, there's no way we're going to be taught by the Holy Spirit. And we don't mean remain open for anything but the Holy Spirit. We're talking about just remain open to the word, to the truth that the Holy Spirit brings. We need to remain closed to other things, but we can't close the wrong door, or can't close the door to the wrong one, the blessed Holy Spirit. Or pride would be another stumbling block. I guess these are some of the big ones, your intellect or your education or your pride. I mean, the human heart is Pretty deceptive, the Bible tells us. It can have a lot of hidden agendas, ill-founded motives that cause us to resist change in our life. The psalmist prays in Psalm 19:12 that God will cleanse him from secret faults because he said, who can know his own heart? Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17, and I think verse 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. The heart is deceitful above all things. So it's pretty deceptive, and it can tell you that you don't have pride when in fact you do, and your pride is a very stumbling block to receiving anything further from God. I said that the heart can have hidden agenda, ill-founded motives, through the fear of the loss of gain, or the loss of reputation, or the loss of self, which is what it amounts to. That's what humility and being poor in spirit and being one who mourns and one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness and so forth are all about. People who fear loss of gain or fear loss of reputation. What will, what will happen if I have to admit that I was wrong? What will happen if I have to go back on something that I believed or said earlier? What will people think of me if I have to change my mind? So people think thoughts like that and they're afraid of the answers and so... The heart, because it is a fairly deceptive thing, causes them just to keep the door closed to any change. They resist change in their life because there's deception in their heart. And there's deception there because the heart is a proud thing. It doesn't want to have to change. It does not want to submit itself to the yoke of Jesus Christ. Pride is an abominable thing in the eyes of God. We read in the scriptures that those who are proud are the ones whom God resists, but he gives grace to the humble. 1 Peter 5 and James 4. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, we're back to, I guess, uh, 
talking about those who are humble, we're back to Matthew 5, 3 and following. It breathes a spirit of humility and of gentleness here. God resists the proud. Pride isn't, pride isn't just uh, what you see in Hollywood or, you know, it's not just an external. Some of the depths of pride are the internals that are in a man's heart. It's out of a man's heart. It's not the outside of the man. It's out of a man's heart proceed all these evil faults and blasphemies and fornications and thefts and adulteries and pride. Pride is an evil fault. It's out of the heart of man these things proceed. We tend to think that there's a proud person because... You know, maybe the way they're dressed or something. And there's a lot of pride in Hollywood, but it all starts on the inside. That's all in the heart. Pride is more than uh, what you get involved in when you get involved with murals. I think they named those things vanities, didn't they? Because there's something about that. People who spend too much time in front of them. It's all right to spend the appropriate amount of time in front of one so that you get to church looking like you're halfway prepared to be at church. I don't know if anybody intended anything by it, but whoever built our building for us didn't put any mirrors in any of our bathrooms. <laughs> We've already commented on that. Well, I wonder what's behind that there. No mirrors in the bathrooms. Well, we don't have a doctrine against mirrors. Amen. I got a mirror in my study. If I remember, I look in it before I come out here. And that's just to make sure my hair that have a big cow lick in the back of it or something, you know, saying it looks like a stick of alfalfa. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Sometimes I forget. I don't even look in it. So I hope that I'm okay whenever I come out. If, I, if, I, if I'm not ever, then let me know before I start. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm up here and you're sitting out there, all of you are red and nervous, and I'm not because I don't know anything is happening that I should be nervous about. You know what that's like. We've all watched someone deliver a speech and we're just staring at what they've done wrong there. We're just so agitated for them and feel so sorry for them and they don't feel anything. They feel just fine. So stop me because no one's going to receive the message until we get our hair slicked back down or whatever's wrong, you know. Or get the buttons on your collar done. You know, these newfangled collars, it's just another thing you've got to do. I saw somebody who came to church one time, and there was that nice, long sleeve, probably brand new, button-down collared shirt on. The buttons weren't done, though. <laughs> kind of defeats the purpose of wearing a button down, doesn't it, if you don't button the buttons? <laughs> so I guess a mirror serves that purpose, you know. You want to make sure that your buttons are done. We all have our problems there. I think it was a few weeks ago, we were going out to eat somewhere, and I had gotten my clothes on and dressed up, and, you know, you put your shirt on and tie it, and, you know, back in the olden days, you didn't have the buttons, so you didn't have to worry about that. You just tied it and folded your collar down, and you were okay. Or if you really wanted to be cheap, you just clipped the little thing on there. But I, <laughs> I gave that up back when I left Easter in Sunday school, you know, back when I was six or seven, I gave those clip-up things off, clip on things, I gave them up. But anyway, we went out to eat and I had gotten the tie on and buttoned one button down and then got called by one of the children in another room and forgot about the other one. We're, you know, about headed where we were. We were headed out and my wife looked at me and, Rufus, button that other button down there. You're not even presentable to go out. So I didn't look in a mirror, obviously, before I left then. I'm just saying that pride is in a lot of other areas of what we might think of. Someone who spends a lot of time uh, pruning themselves in front of a mirror. That's just one of the, uh, the lesser forms of it. It's those, those subtle forms of it that come out of the heart of man that causes a person not to be teachable, not to be open to change. Well, another stumbling block, I think, to being teachable is maybe age itself. You could include that with intellect and education, but, well, I'm too old to change. I'm, I'm too old to learn anything. I've already learned all there is to learn. And if I haven't learned all there is to learn, and there are some more other things to learn, I'm just too old to change now. Well, praise God, there's good news. You're never too old to change. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God doesn't change, that's for sure, but that's part of the nature of being human beings that we change as we come into more light and as we grow. Now, I was talking to give you another example of this pride, how it comes out of the heart of man, and, and it comes out of the heart of religious man. He's not open to the things of the Spirit of God, and 
Sometimes it comes out in some of the most obvious ways that are not discernible to the individual. But I was talking to my mother the other night on the phone, as a matter of fact, last night, and we, we had a good long talk of a couple of hours or at least an hour and a half, I suppose, and we were talking about the charismatic movement, Pentecostal things and churches and doctrines and things like that. And I guess what brought all that up was that, well, back whenever she received the Holy Spirit, then she ended up a part of a Pentecostal work down there in Memphis, and this was a work that started off very, very small and just began to grow and grow and grow, and before they knew it, they had 800 to 900 to 1,000 people there. And, well, I guess you've got to understand something about the area. It's in South Memphis, and South Memphis back in, you know, several decades, that's where I'm from, whenever I was growing up, it was a, it was a place to live. But now... Uh, Things have changed there, you know, economy has changed, and um, the sociology of it all has changed, and it's getting older and older, the people who live there, and no new people, or at least no new young people are moving into the area. And so the pastor of this church and the other people running the church began to consider, you know, they, have, they hire these consultants that do these demographic studies and things and find out that, you know, we're getting older and older, like you can't see some old people saved or something. But they wanted to get into an area where you could find some young, fresh people, and they're willing to sell the church building to another group who wants to move in there and just pack up everything and take off. Well, about a year ago, my brother-in-law and my sister and their children, who are also a part of that Pentecostal work, they approached the pastor. They wanted a conference with him, and, and they asked him, would you consider, if you're going to move the church, which obviously they had already decided to do, would you consider moving down into North Mississippi? Now, back whenever I was growing up, we lived in South Memphis, not far from the state line that divided Tennessee and Mississippi. And back in those days, North Mississippi, DeSoto County, South Haven is the town's name down there, was just a joke. That was hillbilly city as far as we were concerned up in Memphis. Now everything has changed. Tax rates are lower down in Mississippi. You know how just the metropolitan areas begin to expand anyway. And a whole lot of it has expanded right across the state line down into Mississippi now, and that is a real affluent area down there. It's no longer a hillbilly area that it was 20 years ago. And a whole lot of the people that go to that church in South Memphis come from northern Mississippi anyway. So it just makes sense to maybe if you're going to move the church, move it to where a lot of the people live anyway. Well, you know what his thought is, what my mother told me. She said, now he never came out and said this, but she said, we're not dumb. All of us sat around in that church. We can discern by some of the statements that he's made. We know where he's coming from. He didn't have to say it. He'd be too embarrassed, she said, to say it anyway. But to just give you an idea of what his motives are, he comes from a little small town, little small, small hick town over in Arkansas. And he doesn't want to go back into something that has the stigma of at least formally being a hillbilly area. Where he wants to go is over in southeast Memphis, get closer to the Germantown area where all the rich people in Memphis live. You get in the southeast corner. That's why he wants to go down there. And I, you know, I just laughed. I said, I just, how can you be a minister and you're, and you're judging, you're gearing everything because you know, you've come from a small town hillbilly background yourself and you're kind of ashamed of that. I don't know why you would be. Who cares? I mean, but, but whenever you go up the religious ladder, you've got to be an important person. So you have to be from the right place. Or if you're from the wrong one, then you don't tell anybody about it and you live in the right place so that hopefully they'll just kind of transfer to all aspects of your life, including your birth and childhood. And it won't. Wherever you're from, you're from. Seem like the prophets of Israel, like Amos, Jeremiah, they weren't concerned where they were from. Someone's from Tekoa or someone's from... Wherever, it didn't seem like that bothered them very much where they were from or where they had to go whenever God sent them somewhere to preach and prophesy. But I thought of all the abominable things that you've got a large number of the people, as, as a result, there was just, they had a meeting of some of the people in that church, just a handful, you know, under 100, I guess, met in my sister and her husband's house just last week, and they decided they're going to form another church, just start a new church. They're not going to move all the way over to southeast Memphis and go where all the rich people are. They're going to establish a church right there where they are in North Mississippi. So I told my mother's going to be a part of it. I said, praise God, that'll probably be better for you. <laughs> Get away from those guys who have bad, ill-founded motives for moving the church. You're ashamed of the area that you live in. Now it's an old Geritol generation area, you know. A lot of blacks have moved in. The name of us, White Haven. They named it White because back in those days, no black people lived there. Now it's been nicknamed Black Haven because no whites live there anymore.
So they're all either young black people or old white people. And who wants to minister among people like that? What do you mean having an attitude like that as a Christian? Old white people and young black people, we've got to get out of here. What do you mean trying to move out of an area? That's, that'd be a wonderful area to evangelize. They want to go into an area, they've already picked where they're going to build the church, and, they, and the reason they picked it is because it's, first of all, in southeast Memphis, and secondly, it's in an area that's just surrounded by just scores and scores of apartments and apartment complexes and condominiums. And so, you know, you can get your yuppie people into it in your early 30s who have, probably have a good income, work at the law firm or the bank or whatever, a doctor, and that will increase the income in your church, and you'll be prestigious again. Does it remind one of all of these humble, gentle things that we see in the Word of God? There coming out of the heart of man is pride. Pride and shame about the wrong thing. You should be ashamed of your desire to move for those reasons instead of being ashamed of where you were born in Arkansas. You can't do anything about that anyway. Well, that's amazing that things like that happen. I'm glad that the, my relatives down there who are saved and spirit-filled are getting out of that and getting into another church, starting it. They said, well, I, you're pretty knowledgeable about how you start churches. <laughs> you know, you, you got, they said, it's really an unusual thing. When you come out of you know, a, a church that's already established and you're comfortable and you don't have to do anything, you just show up and they've got everything all ready for you and you start meeting in your living room, well, we all know what that's all about. Praise God. Well, Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. Why does he say that? Because those are the only ones who even have the capacity for growth. If you're not poor in spirit, you don't even have the capacity of growth. It's not that you don't want to grow. That's true. You can't grow. You simply can't progress if you aren't poor in spirit. God wants us to remain poor in spirit. He wants us to remain teachable. So what, is it rem what does it mean tonight to remain teachable? Well, it means that you've still got some salt clay left in your vessel. Your vessel is you, by the way. You still have some salt clay. You haven't become baked hard yet through life's experiences and maybe through all of the conflicting teachings and views that you've heard. You're still pliable. That's what it means to remain teachable, to remain poor in spirit. You've still got some salt clay. Remember that the Bible often characterizes us as that. We are God's handiwork. We are that which God is working on, molding and forming it into his image. But, you know, you can't work with clay whenever it becomes hard. It's brittle, and whenever you try to manipulate and maneuver it, what happens? It breaks and crumbles, and it's destroyed. If it doesn't remain soft and pliable, it can't be dealt with any longer. Once it's already been, and a lot of people are like this, I'm all, I remain pliable long enough, got all the teachings that I need, now I've jumped into the oven real quickly to get baked hard, now they're through. That's the end of life. That's the end of Christian growth as far as they're concerned. They've become baked hard now. They've already gotten through with all of their pliable stage. They're through with learning. They're through with being taught. They're through with being teachable. They jumped into the oven, got baked real hard. God can't deal with them anymore. If the clay becomes hard, you can't mold it. You can't form it anymore. We're told clearly in the Word of God that we are like vessels of clay. We are like pots of clay, and God is the potter who is in the process of molding and forming us into what He desires for us to be, which is the image of His Son, Jesus. He wants us to be what He wants us to be. Maybe not what some people would like for themselves to be. He wants us to be what he wants us to be for his own namesake and for his own glory. Or it's like concrete. Concrete, once you get it poured out and you get the water mixed in, depending on the type of concrete you're using, you only have so long. Once, you, once you've already mixed all the final ingredients and you say, we're through, I mean, for all practical purposes, you're through. If you didn't go ahead and get it poured in the hole... You're still through. It's going to harden whether you leave it there or pour it. It's done. It's over with. You've mixed the final ingredients. There's no more room to grow. There's no more room for anything to be added. It's over with. You're done now. And once you get that concrete poured in there, day or two, it's hard. More expensive concrete, a few hours, it's hard. Real expensive concrete, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It's hard. 
You sink a post in the ground, you put some of that quick setting concrete in there, you mix a little water, you put it in there. It's hard. There's no molding or forming that anymore. The only thing that you can do with that then is to get a big old sledgehammer out and just start pounding and pounding and pounding to knock that loose. I remember whenever we left Minnesota and moved out here, we had some clothesline poles that had been set in, and we had just gotten to use them a little bit, and we were going to move out here, and I thought, well, take the poles with us then. No way. No way. I got a sledgehammer out, and we got all our tools out, and bang, bang, and dug around, and you just soon dig the yard up if you're going to carry the clothesline poles. You know, you'll get one of these big, you know, eight-foot-around type clumps of dirt by the time you got that thing out of the ground. No way. You're not going to move that concrete. All it is is just concrete, just some concrete and sand and rocks and water. That sounds pretty pliable till it, till it uh, hits the elements and sits for a while. Once it sits there, it gets hard, and you're not going to move it then. And that's, and that's how it is with people. God either comes, he can come to us, he comes to us in one of two ways, either gently because we're pliable, so he molds us, or he can say, your heart is like a rock, and my word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces, as Jeremiah said. He comes in one or two ways, either gently just with the word of God. You know, whenever Jesus was on the earth, what did he say about the word that he had taught? What did he say to his disciples, like in John 15, 3? Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Whereas he had to say to Israel through Jeremiah, now ye are destroyed through the word which I have spoken unto you. You can either get cleansed or get destroyed, one or the other. And it depends on us. It depends on how receptive we are. Are you like clay or are you like concrete? You like concrete? You tell me how God's going to be able to gently mold you. Go ahead and try to tell me. Give me an understanding of how he's going to gently be able to work with you if you're like concrete. Uh, I don't believe that he can. He can't work with you when you're like concrete. That means you're set in your ways. You're not teachable any longer. You're just not open to anything beyond what you already know or what comes out of you. You're certainly not open to God using any other vessel to speak to you. That's for sure. You're set in your ways. Now, you tell me how God's going to be able to reach a person like that except with a big 15-pound sledgehammer, and he's going to break the rock in pieces. I mean, he he doesn't want to have to break, but if we become set in the wrong way, then God's going to have to break. Jeremiah talks about this. Turn over to Jeremiah's prophecy. There are are a couple of passages here uh, because God's comparing his work through his ministers and uh, through his word to this pounding activity that has to go on with rebellious people like Israel. Jeremiah 23. It shouldn't have to be like that for God's church, though. We're, because why? Because of Matthew 5, friends, 3 and following. We're supposed to be poor in spirit. We're supposed to remain poor in spirit. We're supposed to be like those people that we call the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily if these things are so. We've got our choice of remaining pliable, soft like clay are becoming baked hard in the oven. Concrete not mixed with water or concrete mixed with water and allowed to sit and set. Jeremiah 23, 29 is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. And look back in <clears throat> chapter 5 uh, and verse 14. Shouldn't have to be this way among us because you speak this word, Jeremiah five fourteen. God says, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. People are wood, the word is fire. Back in Jeremiah 23, 29, is not my word like as a fire? Well, what does that mean? The people are as wood. The people are set as wood. Jeremiah 23, 29 again, is not God's word like a hammer? Then what are the people like? Like a rock that the hammer breaks in pieces. Who's the rock here in this verse? But the people of God. 
Who's the wood back in chapter 5 and verse 14? But Israel, the nation of Israel. What's the fire in Jeremiah 5.14? But God's word. What's the fire in Jeremiah 23.29? But God's word. And yet God said to, through Jesus to the apostles in John 15 and verse 3, ye are clean through the word that I spoke. Not you are destroyed, that you are beaten into pieces. You see, there's an entirely different way in which God's word comes to us because there are different ways in which we find ourselves. Some people are receptive and some aren't. Some are receptive sometimes and not always. And I'm saying it's because of some of the uh, dissensions and discussions that go on around us in the charismatic movement. People become gun-shy and cynical and hardened to that. And we simply cannot allow that to happen. We can't allow any of these stumbling blocks of intellect, age, education, pride, or just the stumbling block of seeing all the controversy around, enter in and choke out the word, choke out the love of the word, choke out the love of the word in our own life. Do we, friends, as we read in church history, the martyrs and those who gave their lives to print Bibles or to carry Bibles into other lands, do we love this word that God has given us? I mean this book called the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. God wants us to love this word and love this book. That is our life. All truth, all godliness, all of God's promises, all the revelation about God is wrapped up here in this book, the word of God. We need to love God's word with a pure heart. If we love God's word with a pure heart, then we're going to stay open. We're going to remain teachable. Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, so then faith, cometh by hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. Now why is it some people don't receive certain truths, non-charismatics don't receive the charismatic message, charismatics don't receive a deeper word, a deeper life message? Because they don't receive the word. And if you don't receive the word about it, you can't have faith for what it is the word's giving to us and teaching to us. Because your faith for that, whatever it is, comes by hearing the word that promises or presents that to us. How can a person receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Christ as Savior in their life, the gifts of the Spirit? How can they receive that if they don't receive the word that gives the teaching on that? Because it's the word that gives you faith to believe for it, to receive it. Amen. Romans ten seventeen. So there is something, again, to underscore the importance of remaining teachable. If you're not teachable, you're not open to the Word, so you can never have faith. That's why you say, I don't believe that. You don't believe that because you don't believe the Word. And if you open yourself to the Word, you'd get faith in your heart to believe the Word. Then you can stop saying, I don't believe that, and start saying, I do believe that. And therefore, I receive that. Paul talks in Ephesians 5 and verse 26, again, about the church being presented to Christ, having been washed, by the water of the word, washed by the water of the word, Ephesians 5.26. And so I'd like to give you just a, a couple of concluding ideas and thoughts here, and maybe this is really the most important part of our study tonight, um, as to this teaching and what it really means, blessed are the teachable we could go through a long list and say, now, if you're teachable, then that means that you do this and that you do that and that you overcome your fears and insecurities and you overcome your prejudices and you close your eyes to the vessel and open your ears to the words so if you hear the truth of the word. You know, we could go through a long list of this is what it means to be teachable and here are the steps. And, and it, what it could almost be is counterproductive because what you're trying to produce is a teachable spirit in the people and they hear all they've got to do to be teachable and they don't receive what they have to do to be teachable. I mean, you almost got the car before the horse then. If those are the things that you have to be taught before you can be teachable, then what happens if you aren't teachable to those things that you have to be taught that will make you teachable? So let's make it real simple. The only way that a person's going to be teachable or remain teachable is to stay tender in their heart. It's to stay tender. I used the term pliable, soft earlier, but I mean tender because I mean it in a real emotionally committed to God sense. That you're emotionally committed to him from your heart, that you're spiritually committed to him 
And as a result of that, you remain tender. I mean, I've met people who are tender, and I've met people who are hard. I mean, who have become hardened to life, to truth. They've lost that twinkle, that spark in their eyes. They've lost that little extra step they put in between what you and I would take as a normal step. They add in an extra one because they're so happy. Someone said, I sing because I'm happy. Some people skip because they're happy. They've lost that. Oh, praise God. I, I haven't lost that. I'm, I'm confessing I haven't because I haven't, but I'm going to keep on confessing that I haven't so that I keep on maintaining that in my life. You just skip sometimes, say, oh my, what a wonderful day. You might not talk about bluebirds on your shoulder, but what a wonderful day. Well, I've been sung that once or twice. Zippity-doo-dah. Oh my, what a wonderful day. Well, it should be for an overcomer, for a Christian. Why can't you just, instead of taking one step, go ahead and take two. Do a little dance between your normal steps. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. I remember, friends, whenever I first got saved, this is, this, is how, this is how God brought me into all this. That's why it's real. You know, I didn't come into this as some old-time figure or some educated intellectual figure. I came into it just as a child. See, I wasn't old and I wasn't educated. I was just a child whenever I came into it. And you're supposed to have certain characteristics as a child, or one who's not fully grown or mature. You're supposed to have certain characteristics there, and evidently I did, and most people, I guess, do. And if you have that, oh my, it just makes the word that much easier to, uh, what, swallow, shall we say. Some people just about choke it to get it down. And whenever I heard these truths of Christ as Savior and the Holy Spirit as the one who would indwell me and my body, I thought, what a privilege to learn these things. What a privilege to be taught these things. Hard to swallow? Just get out of my way <laughs> so I can receive. Praise God. Whenever I found it out, out about the Holy Spirit, a brother came to our house and he was telling me about that. And I'd only been saved about eight months or maybe seven months at the time and I just wanted him to get out of there so I could get to business and get receiving the Holy Spirit. Why well, talk about it? Now that I've been introduced to the subject of the Holy Spirit, let's go ahead and be about the Holy Spirit's business and receive it. Praise God. I hear a sister here has received the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Got another mother in here who's got the baptism in. Hallelujah. Praise God. That's a real blessing to hear. The blessing to talk to my mother last night, knowing that she's got the baptism and leaving this big church you're going to start a little church praise God well I just I'm really thankful to God for that that my mother has the Holy Spirit and speaks in tongues and my sisters do and one of my brothers-in-law does praise God that's a real blessing to have well uh, like I was saying whenever I first came into this I, I had a real gentle heart and attitude and spirit and that's why things were so easy to receive. I didn't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit the first time I tried just because I didn't have quite enough instruction there. You know, you have to be instructed. You have to know, well, you don't have to be, but it helps to know something. It'll probably cut down on frustration because you'll probably receive whenever you're taught right and you have faith in the Word of God. But I know that I just wanted the brother on out of the room so I could go about receiving the Holy Spirit. There are a couple of verses that I've just been meditating on the past few weeks been meditating on them because they were some of the first ones that uh, I memorized way back in those years. That's been a long time ago. And I thought I'd share them with you. Uh, if, if nothing else, maybe just in sharing some of these scriptures with you, you can understand what I mean when I say that you've got to remain tender. That you've got to remain tender. Now, I don't know how I come across all of you all the time. Maybe sometimes I don't come across that way. But I know me. And some of you know me, and my wife, my children know me on the side or whenever I'm not in the pulpit or whatever, but I just believe this is the way that it has to be, that you've got to stand for truth. There's no question about that. But there's a balance. There's another side of that message. Man, you can get so caught up standing for truth and zealously defending the faith that you just become a statue, an icon before you know it, you know. You're just dead on behalf of the truth, just a statue frozen there, person frozen in stone saying, I'm earnestly contending for the... Well, and you can't even get it out. You're frozen then for the faith once delivered to the saints. We're going to do that. No apologies for defending the faith once delivered. 
But I don't think you'll be affected defending the faith once delivered in, as a minister or in your own life if you don't remain tender in your own life. So a couple of verses. Now these may seem strange to you. <laughs> I bet you don't have at least one of these memorized. Now I could think of some others, but only two came to mind, so I'm going to take that as being from the Lord, and I'm not going to try to think of any more. Psalm 4, 7. You may want to look at these. I can quote them to you. Psalm 4, 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. He said, now why did you memorize a verse like that? Well, all right, because I'll tell you. Because of the term gladness in the verse. I mean, for those days, whenever you've got what they call a bumper crop of corn or grain and of grapes, which you'd make wine out of, and you've just got this huge production, and what's the natural man think whenever he gets a raise at pay or a uh, raise in pay on the job or something? He's all excited. He's glad. His heart's filled with gladness. Sama said, you have put gladness in my heart more than what could ever be put there by some external increase in my own life. Thou hast put gladness in my heart. Gladness. I was so glad that I was saved. I was so glad that I was saved. I was so happy that I was born again. Because I guess I had been around long enough in religious circles. I had seen some of these rock stars, these big rock stars. They got saved and they just went around telling their testimony. They came out of uh, Satanism and drugs and the occult and all this. And now they've got a glorious testimony. And I look at myself and think, well, well, you know, I don't have anything like that to go around and tell anybody about. I don't have anything to tell them just except a real simple story. It wasn't as though I thought that I didn't need to get saved or something. I recognized I needed to get saved as much as those guys did. But I didn't, I didn't have anything to tell anybody about except I got saved. They'd go around saying, I used to be this, and I used to own that, and I had these cars, and I had these homes, and I got saved and gave it all up, and I didn't have anything like that to tell. So I didn't have any of the external things like that. Yet I was so glad, I was so glad that God had put gladness in my heart, and he put gladness there when he put Jesus and the Holy Spirit there. Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Ghost. And we're told that by Luke in Acts 13, 52, after they'd just been persecuted and thrown out of a city, the city of Iconium. For the continued.